So just to introduce, uh, see, uh, the idea of this IC was that this is a relatively untouched topic. I'm sure in pediatric ophthalmology practice, uh, many of us actually, you know, uh, have a visually inattentive child. And that's why we thought that, you know, we'll just put this uh, instruction course just to touch upon some of the uh, lesser known facts, I would say. Obviously, you will had, have your own tips and tricks, but uh, maybe, uh, you know, we'll all learn from each other, you know, when we actually just put it across. So, uh, just to start, uh, apart from me, uh, we have Dr. Virinder Sajdeva who would be, uh, you know, talking to you about specifically the retinal dystrophies. Dr. Virinder is a senior consultant, uh, you know, at Elu Prasad Eye Institute and uh, Vishakapatnam. And he's been uh, really instrumental in, uh, you know, the field of strabismus and neuroophthalmology. Presently, he's, uh, you know, a pioneer uh, working in the field of neuroophthalmology. And we thought, let's understand his perspective uh, when it comes to retinal dystrophies, you know, in these children. Then we have, uh, you, know, you know, Dr. Ramesh Kirkinya, who's been a mentor to uh, most of us, uh, a dear friend, and really, uh, you know, uh, you can say one of the pioneers uh, working in this field and we wanted to understand you know from him uh, the uh, the cerebral visual impairment uh, and I'm sure there will be a lot of things to learn from him and then a very untouched uh, topic I would say uh, is visual rehabilitation and follow-up and that's why we wanted a full session on this and uh, an ophthalmologist perspective rather than you know a, a, you know a rehabilitation expert uh, perspective because uh, probably an ophthalmologist would be able to connect it uh, better. And who better than Dr. Shailja Tibriwal? She is a senior consultant working in Shroff Eye Center uh, who will take us through you know, some of the steps of visual rehabilitation and follow-up. So in all, I think we have an interesting uh, uh, discussion you know, uh, stored up and hope you'll enjoy it. So with your permission, sir, I'll just start right away so that we have time at the end. So I am uh, just an ardent uh, learner of pediatric ophthalmology, and I would be talking to you, you, you know, about asadham workup and diagnostic clues. Maybe you know this will help us, uh, you know, analyze these children better. So visually inattentive child is a child who is basically inable, inab unable to make an eye contact without auditory stimuli, and. You know, in a routine way, when you're testing, when you're testing, he's not able to focus on the mother's face, and he's not really, you know, even responding uh, very great to, you know, the bright light. So this is basically a visually inattentive child, and if we just, you know, want to take it further, uh, the first thing, obviously, like anything else, we have to start with the history. So if you ask the child, you'll get uh, the, the child parents, you'll get a lot of inputs which will help you ultimately arrive at the diagnosis. The child's general development, how has been the, uh, you know, prenatal and perinatal history, because if there are, you know, evidence of hypoxia and the gestational age, uh, you know, is uh, premature, you would have different set of things to think about, you know, when you actually go ahead. Was, were there any medications taken by the child or the mother, like some children are on anti-seizure medication that uh, also contributes to the cerebral visual impairment? Do we have any systemic medical, uh, you know, problems like respiratory problems, like a case of Joubert syndrome, you know, may have respiratory distress? And then, of course, you know, the family history, the history of consanguinity and blindness in other family members, that is, you know, very helpful. Just one question to the parents, how well your child can see and you will sur be surprised to know that they would be actually taking you through, you know, some of very interesting uh, clues which will help you to really see that this child actually, you know, probably has this kind of disorder. So that is very important to understand the parent's perspective. And is it combined with any deviation of the eyes? What is the, you know, parent's perspective? Does the child has any abnormal local movements? And obviously, you actually do a pedigree charting to, you know, take it further. So when you do a routine examination, it's very easy, I would say, <coughs> for a routine uh, pediatric ophthalmologist or, you know, for a general ophthalmologist to rule out certain things, whether it's, uh, 
you know the media opacities or the refractive errors but the challenge is that when you actually have a relatively normal local examination then what could be possibilities and that's how you know the crux of this presentation is you know what do we do about you know those things so unfortunately the routine protocol you know of uh, the examination however innovative you may be still doesn't work in a visually inattentive child and that's how you know we want to actually just share that uh, when you actually see these children who are not receptive to any visual stimuli how to really go about it so small things so suppose the child is uh, you know really not attentive uh, and uh, you would want to actually start with small visual targets you know in the visual field you want to project uh, and that's in the upper left panel that you're seeing in the video that we are just showing this child you know some small visual targets and he is not really responding then what you do maybe you know just shift to some bigger visual stimuli you know in the field maybe he'll be receptive to that because there are some seeing areas and some non seeing areas and if we uh just say what is the best stimulus you know for the child to really respond to it remains the mother's face so at 6 to 8 weeks normally we say that you know the child starts fixating maybe a little earlier these days but then a mother's face remains the best stimulus and if the mother is saying that you know the child is not really to really you know uh look at me that really means a lot and then of course you know the routine threat perception and other things and all may just come at around 5 months so you may have to you know wait for that much time but then sometimes it's a real dilemma that you know whether the child is really seeing or not because it's uh, the parents are very you know they get panicky doctor tell me you know my child can see or not so that's why sometimes you have to go to the next step that sometimes you know dynamic stimuli you know stimuli which are moving the child may actually respond to that it may not be a static stimuli that the child would responding and that's what you shown and sometimes in a dark room you have to actually show this jingle uh, the the colored stimulus and all and you may actually get a flicker of a response you know in a particular area so all those things we can simply document so your visual acuity documentation may not be you know the child is not cooperative for visual uh, you know up to types or not you can just say the child is you know having transient fixation it may not be sustained it may not be following but just put it in exact words whether he is you know blinking his eyes in response to indirect uh, ophthalmoscope so that's all you know like you can just put it in a descriptive manner so that's what you know i'm just stressing uh, now ocular motility you know one can just see but obviously the child is not following then how do we do that so what you can do is probably you know just use this reflex eye movements so we turning the child so doll's eye you know you know the child would be turning the eyes in opposite manner so this will just help us analyze that do we have something like congenital ocular motor apraxia you know which could have been in this child and that's why the child is not following and then uh, in a relatively older child probably you can use the proprioception like you use in you know, another visually inattentive person you know so you can just tap the finger and this ask the child to just you know look in that direction so that proprioceptive stimulus sometimes helps then you can actually use uh, you know the uh, vestibular ocular reflex where you can just uh, you know like rotate the child uh, both horizontally and vertically and see if there are any refixation sockets because if there are refixation sockets the child is actually you know fixating and in a blind infant the nystagmus the induced nystagmus vor that would be more prolonged so that's a very very useful test you know let's say a 2 months or a 3 3 months old you know child then it's sometimes you know felt that we cannot check the pupils and other things and all but it's all in the mind you know if you really want to check the pupils you know with all the uh, things and all maybe not to an accommodative stimulus but then you know the regular pupils should be a part of you know the examination of a visually inattentive child so pupils because paradoxical pupils sometimes occur in these patients because when you actually switch off the lights you know you may actually have a little pupillary constriction and that may be part of retinal dystrophies so these are small clinical clues and just to combine this diagnostic clues for a reference if you have nystagmus the eye poking or you know the inophthalmic 
you know, child along with visual intention means it's a long-standing visual loss, especially in LCA, Leber's congenital amaurosis. If you have RAPD, anterior visual pathway lesion, you know, may be there. Then paradoxical pupil in retinal dystrophies, I just mentioned. So all those are diagnostic clues which will actually help you, you know, really uh, put a diagnosis, you know, when you actually go ahead. Then nystagmus is very, very characteristic, you know, of an anterior visual pathway lesion. Cerebral visual part uh, impairments do not really have a nystagmus. Then do not miss the other things like hypopigmented skin, hypopigmented iris, and, you know, the fundus, which may be really pathognomic of oculocutaneous albinism because these infants are slow to see. The iris stimulus transillumination defects are there. And when you see, there may be macular hypoplasia. So all those things, you know, uh, may not be very apparent initially, but if you carefully, you know, have a look at, you know, these things, the child having little photophobia, you know, when you're turning the lights. So all those things may be subtle clues. Then do not miss the mannerism, you know. These patients may actually have mannerisms, you know, some behaviorals like a child actually, you know, just shaking his head on either side or, you know, poking or, you know, like moving the uh, fingers. So all those things are, you know, basically because, you know, when your visual processing is deficient, the child actually gains some kind of stimulus by, you know, doing these, you know, maneuvers. So this may be a part of, you know, the visual inattentive child. Then do not forget that a good refraction may actually, you know, suddenly turn up your visually inattentive child, uh, you know, uh, behavior on and he may suddenly be receptive. So very, very relevant, uh, especially in a, you know, young child, do not forget the plus four diopter, you know, tests where if you just place a, a plus four diopter lens, you know, like the uh, over two months or three months old baby, suddenly it may turn receptive, especially, you know, children uh, who have, uh, you know, autism and, you know, other stuff, because they may simply have a high hyperopia. You may not be able to do a refraction then, but if you just do that, that turns in dawn. Then cases, you know, where the retina is almost normal and you're not really getting a diagnosis, pediatric electrophysiology, which we'll have a next session, you know, obviously it does have a big role, but it's not <coughs> conclusive, you know, sometimes, because especially, you know, in an infant where the uh, circuits are being just developed, so it's not something, you know, which is very helpful in a less than one year, but then more than one year, Yes, you know, it can give you very characteristic, uh, you know, findings. And always make sure that sometimes you may have to repeat the electrophysiology, you know, maybe two, three times to get more, uh, you know, like repeatable reasonings. So some examples, like a simple case of LCA where you have extinguished uh, scotopic and photopic, uh, you know, ERGs, which helps you nail the diagnosis. Then you have... Uh, the uh, achromatopsia or a cone disorder, you know, syndrome where you have extinguished uh, photopic ERGs compared to a normal ERG. And mind you, the fundus was quite normal in these cases. And then you have a relatively electronegative ERG, you know, uh, in a case of CSNB or congenital stationary night blindness. The child also has nystagmus and, you know, a session of myopia. So these are all pointing towards, you know, a, diagnosis of CSNB and then you know this CVI or the cerebral visual impairment where the child's history you know revealed that the child actually had uh, uh, you know uh, prematurity and you know he had on examination microcephaly there was no nystagmus there was history of by birth hypoxia you know which could really be picked up in the uh, neuroimaging you know where uh, the ischemic area especially in the watershed areas it not may not be as marked as this but just, uh, you know, the watershed areas may just tell you, you know, these, uh, uh, reveal these ischemic areas. And then you have, you know, some children who really have a very normal history and normal examination and their neuroimaging is also okay and they are simply visually delayed. You know, they catch up function by around one year. So this remains a diagnosis of exclusion, you know, the delayed visual maturation. Always remember that in these situations, we need our colleagues, the pediatrician, the geneticist, and the neurologist to really, you know, 
not only make a diagnosis but to also have the expert you know advise to take the child ahead because let's not forget that these children actually have a long life and if they get the appropriate therapy and if i may just add a rehabilitation specialist also because if we actually you know just give them that help in the initial years that's the concept you know the, of the early rehabilitation you know that's catching up these days and then uh, we have an entire session on the uh, rehabilitation where not only the visual uh, rehabilitation but the physiotherapy you know the speech therapy you know as the child goes along you know that has to be uh, you know given uh, to the child and just to summarize so we have a child with visual loss i may just spend about a minute here a busy slide so obviously you know when you examine the child you know that you would be probably able to rule out these you know structural defects whether it's a media opacity or you know albinism or phobian hypoplasias optic nerve hypoplasias and then you have a subset two where you have a normal fundus say with pigmentary retinopathy and nystagmus so rather than going for a neuroimaging first you know that because it's the child has nystagmus because there are some you know subtle clues in the fundus you may want to do an erg first now the erg can help you nail you know retinal dystrophies like you know say leber's congenital amaurosis csnb or you know the achromatopsia and if they have an associated neurological problem they you would want to you know rule it out you know by some biochemical uh, you know help also like paroxysmal disorders ncl neuronal uh, ceroid lipofuscinosis and then if you don't have an nystagmus it's mainly pointing towards to a neurological processing problem where the child actually may have a normal fundus and uh, the child may just be having a cerebral visual impairment uh, where you can actually just you know nail the diagnosis by a uh, you know like a uh, mri uh, which can be done and you know the diagnosis can be there and once you have a diagnosis not only the child requires a diagnosis but the child obviously requires a visual rehabilitation just to acknowledge you know the uh, past and present uh, workplaces that i worked with the entire teams obviously this has the role and just to highlight so i don't know whether ultimately they turn to be you know really talented uh, young individuals and if they really have a good help in the initial years i think that can make all the difference thank you very much uh, may i invite now dr virendra sasdeva he would be talking to us about the retinal dystrophies thank you dr sumit for interesting uh, videos and talk uh, just a um, simple thing to add on to it's that the vp and erg both as he also pointed out that within one year of life they're not very reliable it depends upon how they are done so many a times patients come that the vp done elsewhere has been non recordable and they are in a state of panic uh, but actually the child can can see so your evaluation and also you have to wait and repeat these tests in after uh, follow up time and see never say to a child that you cannot see because more more than often in my experience they have uh, whatever little experience i have they have improved over time so uh, that's a thing that to tell to them